work? Yes. Yeah. The population in the, aud the audience has diminished quite a bit. I, I think I've it's, scared them. Well, maybe it's, a bit, it's maybe an evolutionary process as well. That we've noticed it before. So the, anyway, the floor is yours. Who wants to ask the first question? That's not the first question. Then, yes, give your name, please. Hi, my name is Ajay, uh, Yale NUS and A-Star. Um, so my question is to both of you. Uh, so we've been discovering a whole lot of exoplanets by the dozen. Um, so planets? If, uh, exoplanets. Yeah. So if you were to uh, describe what is universal about evolutionary theories or you know, evolutionary aspects, what would you go with in terms of what we find elsewhere if life exists? Okay, that's a very good question. Shall I start? What do you want to say? Yes? Uh, I think uh, uh, some of what I've shown is actually giving uh, answers to that. Um, because I didn't speak much about it, but what really determines this variational component are the physics of development. So uh, evolutionary changes of gene regulatory systems, for example, they have an eff effect on the physical properties uh, of cells that you know are uh, three-dimensional objects that have volume and tension and uh, uh, adhesivity and, and these kinds of things. And uh, so my strong suggestion, or my strong, um, how do you say it, belief, uh, would be that uh, if we would find life on these exoplanets, they would be dependent on the physics uh, of, uh, of that, that, that are present there. Uh, and if something like a genetic code would arise, or some similar you know, uh, medium for transmitting uh, information, then it would be uh, in interacting with, with, with that type of physics. And, and to, so I would say the forms that we would be able to find are not entirely unpredictable. Uh, if there is movement, for example, we would have bilaterality and maybe forward ends and posterior ends and things. So, so I think from our knowledge of, of what has evolved here to a certain <laughs> limited extent, uh, we could make predictions about uh, those forms. What do you think, Ursh? Um, well, first of all, I, I, I'm not terribly optimistic, I have to confess, about finding life elsewhere or uh, well, finding life elsewhere easily, right? But that's a, that's, a, that's a prediction that we will be able to test in a limited neighborhood very soon. I was talking to uh, Martin Rees, uh, the astronomer royal, about this, and he told me that in about 15 years we will be able to analyze the atmosphere of, uh, you know, quite a few exoplanets. Now, of course, uh, uh, what uh, you can say is that the at if the atmosphere is uh, manifestly out of thermodynamic equilibrium, like the atmosphere of the Earth is, then you can have a strong suspicion that something like a lifelike life, uh, life process is there. Now, because I have been dealing so much with the origin of life and similar processes, <coughs> My prediction is, and I would be most happy to be proven wrong, that we are not going to find probably even one. Huh? But we, can, we shall see. I would be happy if we could, but probably we are not going to find one. I think that life on Earth is very uh, valuable, because I think that it's a very difficult process. Now, suppose, however, that life did originate, right? then you can ask the following questions. How many of them will have uh, gone beyond molecular replicators? How many of them would have developed something like a division of labor within two or more kinds of nucleic acids and so on? And the answer is that uh, we don't know. The, the, our knowledge is really not at the level. However, what I could uh, agree with was that it would have you know, life some uh, 
mechanism for, uh, for basic genetic inheritance, and that genetic inheritance would be digital. Huh? Whether, you know, the, it would be four digits or six digits or, you know, or only, uh, only two, I, I don't know. And whether it would be nucleotides or something that can do inheritance but without being, you know, uh, a nucleotide structure, that's widely open, right? So the only expectation about which is strong is that there will be something like digital inheritance, you know, to, 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 to uh, the, because that allows yeah, efficient evolution in search in a fine-tuned way, right? And to keep the fine distinction stable, that's very important. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that we are very likely to find easily in our neighborhood life. I mean, if you calculate the probability of the origin of life, you know, and you can tune it, there is a so-called Drake equation that gives you the number of expected civilizations. You know, it's very easy to, to tune the Drake equation that the outcome is that there is one expected civilization per galaxy and that's us, goodbye. Uh, we don't know. We don't know where they are. Any further comments? Yes. Other questions? I agree with my esteemed colleague. Very good. <laughs> yes, all the way in the back. Please give your name and ask the question. Hi, um, I'm Johendron. I'm from the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology. Uh, I'm fascinated by your idea of genetic memory. Uh, ge evolution has always been perceived as a unidirectional, divergent kind of a system. Do you have any evidence where you see this kind of like a, perhaps a re reversion into the ancestral organism? If, does that actually, is that reasonable to expect or am I missing something? Uh, okay, uh, that's for me. Yes, I think you mentioned yeah, the memory. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, 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 well, I mean, there are so-called atavisms of course, but that's uh, a slightly different type of phenomenon. But what uh, we can say at the moment is that there are theoretical reasons to expect that there is something which is similar to learning in genetic evolution, right? And this uh, has been worked out, you know, for the RNA case. There is another uh, paper uh, which was working it out for, for genetic regulatory networks and so on, right? Uh, and then even you can estimate the capacity. How many, for example, a, a genetic regulator, we are doing it now. This is why I, I, I am talking about. So, uh, because for a neural network, right, like a Hopfield network, you know, there are extremely good ways of estimating, you know, how many different memory patterns you can store, right? For, for example, for this kind of genetic memory, uh, system in, in, in the developmental network, uh, we, don't yo we don't know yet. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is much more limited than, than, uh, than uh, in the case of the neural networks. One reason being, you know, that uh, decent uh, neural networks, you know, have easily tens and, you know, uh, 50,000 and these kinds of components, right? And the number of components influences how many patterns you can store. Uh, but the prediction is that these effects can be found also experimentally in the future, right? And it would be important to find out. This is how we are at the, where we are at the moment. All right. Who has the next question? Yes. Hi, my name is Shaman Lu. I'm from uh, Institute of Medical Biology. Uh, I have a question about the um, uh, how to say uh, we, we humans we are uh, intelligent uh, animals um, so but like most of the animals when they face a problem like uh, if there's less sea ice the polar bears have to retreat to an area that is colder um, but we have this self recognition we know what is evolution we know what is the problem in the environment so we will uh, open up conferences and think, uh, talk about this problem. And so there's like, we, we are fighting back to these problems. 
Uh, what will you say uh, about this self-recognized will influence uh, our, our uh, uh, response in the, in the evolution? <coughs> well, well, one of the, f the first components is, is that you need to understand the system before you can uh, kind of correct uh, mistakes. Uh, and in, in our case, it's largely a cognitive and behavioral problem that we are facing, uh, and it's collective behavior. Uh, and we have actually been discussing this over the last two days several times, how, uh, how our uh, collective behaviors are getting more or less out of you know, any possible control. Uh, because uh, because we may very well uh, have such meetings, conferences, decisions, uh, 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 deadlines for reaching certain goals and all that. But, for example, the two of us, uh, Ersh and I, we fly from Europe to here, uh, creating an enormous, you know, uh, CO2 output and, and other aspects. Uh, and, and, and we don't actually behave in a very rational way. And uh, so our systems become more and more economy driven. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and therefore the prospects are really uh, limited. Uh, we, we, we need as an academic community uh, to stand up. Uh, and 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 do something, not just have conferences uh, and memoranda. Uh, I think um, otherwise, and 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 it needs to get to the political leaders. Now, what I understand from Singapore is that this is in fact the case. Um, but 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 in Singapore is a very special situation uh, because uh, decisions can be taken. Uh, once the problem is realized. In other countries, all decisions are hampered by a incredibly complicated uh, democratic uh, procedures. So until something is actually being decided, uh, the problem has overwhelmed us. Um, but but uh, maybe Ersh would like to, to f continue the comment. Uh, the, yeah. the, the, okay, there are a few uh, things I want to mention. One is that uh, uh, it's really a very, very big problem that uh, most economists are still fascinated by this goal of ongoing economic growth. Yes. That's an absolute nightmare. This is the kind of greed, right, that is going to very likely if uh, something doesn't happen, that is going to ruin our planet, right? It's, uh, now uh, there is the concept of the ecological footprint. The ecological footprint uh, of a country is the size of territory that the country needs, you know, in terms of uh, land and, and water and so on, in order to maintain itself at the state where the country is, right? Now, you have got several countries whose uh, economic footprint, uh, uh, eco ecological footprint, sorry, ecological footprint is much bigger than the country itself. Huh? Now, that you may say, okay, but there are other countries, you know, with a lot of poor people, so, you know, they can sort of, uh, you know, uh, give away their own non-existing ecological, but, the trouble is, if you count all the ecological footprints together, now it's 150% uh, of the Earth, okay? So it's, the situation cannot be maintained. It's crumbling. One of the consequences is that if you look at the number of species that are disappearing, we are living under a time of a so-called mass extinction, right? It fits all the data of the previous, but the problem is that that is due to us, right? Uh, so there is a very big problem with all these taken together. And uh, I want to give you some real warning about a problem that people don't think about. It's extremely difficult to kill life on the earth. 
Uh, probably even if the Earth were fragmented by a major catastrophic impact, but many of the pieces would still uh, circle the sun, uh, the sun in the habitable zone. Life would still be preserved on them. So it's almost impossible to, to kill life as such, right? Uh, but uh, it's also quite uh, difficult to, to just kill mankind as such. What is, however, very easy to do is to kill technological civilization. Because technological civilization has so many interdependencies now that if you cut you know, just a certain number of links, it's a concept called deletion stability. You know, uh, our uh, society, the technological society, is very unstable from the deletion point of view. Now, suppose that it crumbles, right? Then the problem is that, the, that there is no second start because all the easily accessible things like iron, carbon, and so on uh, have gone, right? So even these things are now accessible on a sufficient scale only with fine technology. But it's exactly that fine technology that is going to disappear when the technological civilization crumbles. Right? So that's a very dangerous thing. It's not, you, 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 you just shouldn't say, well, then we start and you, uh, no, you are not going to. You are, uh, uh, you are going to have a very interesting life uh, at the level of the upper paleolithic and then that's it. And may I add to this? May I add to this? But it's really a very pressing problem. Um, and there is one simple thing that, uh, that we need to understand. All our economics are based on growth. Uh, all uh, economists predict how much growth we need to sustain uh, society and so on and so forth. But the biologists can easily demonstrate there is no unlimited growth in a limited system. It cannot work. And therefore, if we cannot convince, you know, uh, uh, the economy and, and business leaders and so on, that we must aim for a more homeostatic kind of uh, market and, and uh, um, um, uh, in, in um, how do you call it, manufacturing society industry, um, uh, then, uh, then this, this, by necessity, needs will crumble because you know you can do this yourself. Every one of us can do it. You have a little aquarium, uh, and uh, you you have a few organisms, and uh, uh, and then one of them, uh, you, you know, starts uh, to explode in growth. Uh, so it inevitably this small system comes to limits where a threshold effect happens uh, and, and, and that is the real danger that, 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 that it is not realized today that, that, that the, um, the economic problem, uh, the environmental problem is not a linear problem. It's, it's not the case that we can predict from you know, the warming now, for example, uh, how it will be in 10 years, uh, because the effects are additive and, uh, and uh, uh, reach threshold tipping points when you cannot do anything anymore. Uh, like if that aquarium that I've just explained, if you warm it up, you know, it, the water gets warmer and warmer and warmer, but at one particular point, all the fish in it will die. You know, uh, and, and therefore, uh, I have been talking about threshold phenomena in development, but that's true for e uh, e ecological systems as well. Please go on. I, I just would like to add a, a, a very uh, forceful metaphor, uh, and that's the following. It's, uh, it's anecdotal, the beginning of it. So I, as Balaj, uh, I was also growing up in communist Hungary, and then there was the time when you know people were uh, traveling to strange parts of the Soviet Union, you know, to botanize there in these kinds of things. Uh, I have never done it. I always declare that I am sick, 
but you know, some other people did. And uh, they were traveling on extremely miserable aeroplanes, right? So every, 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 every journey was a Russian roulette, so to speak. Uh, but, and one of the most exciting journeys was that they did realize that as they, as they were looking at the wings, you know, the screws, some of them were dancing like this, huh? right? Huh? And occasionally one would fly away. Huh? So they were counting how many screws are flying away. And then somebody says, look, so far so good, but I'm sure that there is a limit, right? <laughs> when the next screw, then you know the bloody the uh, wing will break and then we are going to die. Now that's exactly the problem with the species extinction, right? For a while, you know, you can still happily sitting in your armchair and so on. Yeah, maybe a few nasty creatures die out, so what? Right. But you know, I, it's absolutely sure. You don't know where the limit is, but there will be a, a fraction of species. When they have dined out, the rest is going to uh, undergo a catastrophic further uh, death, and that is exactly the problem, you know, like with the wing. Right. Question right here in front. Um, my name is Peter Nixon, um, visiting professor at NTU. I I'd like to challenge some of the comments you've made, actually. Um, the first co comment is that this fixation on e economic growth and how that's bad for the world. Hmm. But there are a lot of poor people out there who would like a bit of economic growth to make their lives better. So. I think it's a bit unfair to say that uh, that economic growth per se is bad. Uh, maybe it's unevenly distributed, but I think that it has to be refocused. Um, I think I think you mentioned that. And the the other the other thing was, I'm, and this is my, displaying my ignorance. I'm, I'm about the mass extinction that's ongoing. Have you got any sense of the scale of the mass extinction in terms of how many species are dying out and out of the total number present in the world? Hmm. Yes, uh, uh, I was not dealing with this question in the last month, so, and, uh, but it's something like, if I remember it well from our discussions, you know, that something like that uh, in about uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, don't get me, you can check it there, you know, the literature is out there. But on the order of magnitude, in about 10 to 20 years, as many as 50. Huh? Half of all the species might disappear if you extrapolate from the present rate. No, and that's what, very significant. What is it at the moment? I'm just, I'm just Sorry? What, what is the, how, many, how many species have become extinct in the last 50 years, say? Well, I mean, uh, you can calculate backwards, you know, how many species there are now, right? So uh, that also partly depends what you regard as species, right? Uh, but uh, you could say it's, uh, it's on the order of, a, you know, uh, a few million, 10 million, you know, something like that, right? So that's, that, that is, that's the rate, you know, it's, 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 this, it's, dip it's disappearing very fast, right? 10 million? Yeah, something like that, yeah? Over what, over what time frame? Yeah, it's uh, something like, uh, I guess, uh, the last, uh, you know, 50 years or something like that. Yeah? So it's uh, something like that. That's, that's just, no, no, of course, that doesn't include only the visible things, you know? There are many, many invisible things that disappear. Huh? And then you are not going to see them, of course, because you don't see them even if they are there. But, you know, you can check the data exactly. The, the, the only thing that I definitely remember is that the, the fraction of the species that are expected to, to disappear, it's really on the order of two digits, you know, per, uh, in percentage. And that's, that's very dangerous, and that's a lot, okay? And uh, what was the other, yeah, the growth? This was a, yeah, uh, the a growth. humanitarian, this yeah. was a humanitarian point, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you're fully right, of course, but does that mean that therefore we have to sustain the model of Western uh, growth because others, you know, maybe, uh, maybe take... It's a question, actually, in fact, of, of whether Western uh, models of, of economic growth actually do benefit so much uh, the civilizations that would require, that would actually... Uh, profit from, from such Well, I, I, th I think it does because we can see all around us that we're, in terms of energy, we are changing our, the way we provide energy, which is better for the planet. 
In terms of that, you talked about the aquarium and, and how, it, how you could, uh, some part of the aquarium could grow quicker. But in Europe, the, the birth rate's going down, I think. So it, there is a sort of um, circular sort of feedback loop in operation where, where the, the, the society does, there, there are constraints on societal growth. Uh, and it's not always population exploding in, in certain areas of the world. And so it's a bit more, I think it's a bit more complicated than you, yeah, you're yes. portraying. It's more complicated, that, but the problem is that you, not, you cannot continue this type of economic growth, right? You have to, and there are experiments, uh, uh, and there, there's a famous experiment in uh, Canada, you know, where they actually had some limited territory, you know, where they were experimenting with, you know, uh, not sustainable growth, but sustainable zero growth, right? And it was actually... Sorry, but have, I don't understand what you mean by growth as in it's bad growth. Good. What do you mean by growth when you say you can't have this sort of growth? I mean, most people think of growth in terms of just earning, having more GDP, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're impacting badly on the environment. You just could be clever in the way you, you generate your wealth. Yes, that, that, that's, that, that's definitely the case. But the problem is, I think, that... Uh, okay, so let me... Let me give you an example which shows what kind of difficulties you can create with the best intentions. Uh, so um, there in, in, in Africa, there is this bulge, <coughs> uh, demographic bulge, of 35 million people, roughly, uh, that uh, are you know, reasonably young. And uh, then people were asking, okay, what, what, what's the reason for the, for, for the budge in Africa? The reason for the budge in Africa is actually what was called the Green Revolution, right? But now these people have, you know, a very strong societal problem, right? Because, you know, they have grown up, that's fine, but the society uh, is, finds it extremely difficult to maintain this extra that was produced because of the extra food that was pumped into the system, right? So I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, these kinds of interventions work, you know? Uh, they, they fire back, right? Uh, don't, don't try to encourage population growth. Don't try to encourage economic growth. T try to find a, 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 a way where, this, where we have a sustainable Existence. Of course, Which you can have you can have sustainability. You can have uh, you know with new new types of plants, new types of uh, watering the plants, agriculture. You could you can you can feed feed a growing population in Africa if the land use is appropriately uh, if land is used appropriately. So I, I'm afraid I don't agree with your point about uh, preventing population growth because it's okay for us in the in Europe, but it's uh, you know there are other areas of the world which. Have missed out so far, and I think they deserve to have a better life. Uh, uh, so what's your point about population? My, my point: you're saying don't use. You're saying don't encourage population growth. Don't, it's, don't. That's an absolute disaster. But I've just pointed out that the population is declining in certain parts of the world. Yeah, but, and it's, a, but it's very. It's it's actually small parts of the world. Well, it's it's still growing, and I and I don't think that this is a sensible thing to do. I mean, uh, somebody uh, remarked, I think very appropriately, that the best way uh, to, uh, to reduce population growth is to actually education. increase the education of women. Mm -hmm. yeah? The correlation is extremely strong, right? So that is something... No, no, I agree with you. Yeah? No, of course, of course, I agree with that. Yes, of course. Well, and men as well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right. Other questions? Other, other questions? Nobody. I, I have actually, actually one question, but it may be very... You talked about evolution of learning. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think we, the evolution will go to the extent that we will learn fast enough so that we can eliminate some of the problems that you just discussed. But can you give some more indication of what you mean by this evolution of learning and what, well, what is happening? Uh, uh, okay, so more specifically, I think you can have the evolution of learning. Evolution, evolution of learning means that you are tracking, you know, how learning mechanisms have evolved. That's one thing. Then you can have another concept. 
the, you can have another concept that uh, is uh, learning in evolution, and then you can have evolution in learning, right? Now, the evolution in learning is what I spoke at the very end of my talk, right? Whether uh, bona fide evolutionary search mechanism could contribute in the brain to more efficient learning, right? Now, the, the flip side of the coin is uh, learning in evolution, which means to what extent uh, uh, phenomena that are analogous to learning can happen in evolutionary systems, right? And we mentioned, you know, that possibly genetic regulator in that, for example. But there is another one where I was working together, actually, actively, with, uh, uh, with uh, Richard Watson, uh, in, in Southampton, and uh, the quest, I, I think the title of the paper, unless I, am, I remember it wrongly, is uh, uh, How Can Ecosystems Learn? Okay, now that's, that's a very interesting thing. So, um, uh, what, what you, it's freely downloadable again, so it's, uh, you can check it, the details easily, but the question is the following. Suppose and you have to start somewhere in your investigation, you have a competitive community, right? So I'm now uh, neglecting the predation, mutualism, or the, because you have to, tr it's, a, it's, a, it's, an ex it's, a, it's of course a, a computer experiment, it's a competitive community. And then you look at, you allow for coevolution, which means that the different species that build up the community can evolve so that the interaction strengths between the different uh, species changes, right? Now, what you find in the model <coughs> under certain assumptions is that uh, the interaction strengths change as if they were following Hebb's rule, right? So, uh, in the Hebb's rule, the neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So the, the, the interaction strength increases between the neurons. And uh, in the competitive system, what you see that the species uh, that are abundant, you know, that uh, are going to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the, the interaction between them, because of course both of them are abundant and they, they don't want to disturb each other because it's in their fitness advantage not to do so. But it's a negative value because if comp it's competition, right? It's negative, negative. So a decrease in competition means that it is going to increase in the positive direction, right? And in the, with that scaling, it's strictly analogous to the Hebbian uh, rule of change. Okay, and by this you can demonstrate that if you expose now the, the ecosystem to two different kinds of regimes, let us say rainy and sunny, and you let the species in the system co-evolve under those regimes, you can again ask the question, if you change the environment back from sunny to cloudy or whatever, how fast is the community going to rearrange itself, which is best for the sunny period, right? And again, you can see that if you do this kind of, uh, how should I say, alternative uh, enforcement on the community, then uh, the interaction strengths change in such a way that the flip to the correct solution gets faster and faster when you make the environmental change. So the ecosystem has learned, you know, that this is a, this is a thing that is good to do. And what is amazing, this is not reinforcement learning, right? So we are not selecting on the community as a whole, right? Everybody, every species is individually adapting to the, uh, to the change. Like in classical happy and associative learning, you know, there is no supervisor for the, you know? it's the whole network that is changing so that there will be attractors that can, you know, store memory and so on. It seems, but, you know, that's a limited model uh, and a lot of more work is ahead. But also in an ecosystem model, this is possible that although every species evolves locally, 
Nevertheless, the community, because of the Hebbian type change in the interaction strengths, you know, can behave as if it learned something. Okay, I think uh, that's enough. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions, or shall we return the chair to Balash with uh, no more questions? And Balash, you have the, right, the last word. Yes, and actually, at the end of each such session, I ask, I ask the speakers to summarize in one minute the take-home message, but with one addition. What would you like to achieve, or what would you like to see in your field in the next five, ten years to be achieved? <laughs> one minute only. <laughs> Shall I begin? Yes. Um, this was on my few last slides. Uh, I would like to see uh, that evolutionary d developmental biology uh, becomes a quantitative science rather than a descriptive one, uh, and that we would be able to achieve a formal integration with certain aspects of uh, 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 the population uh, uh, theory that that ha that is so well uh, developed, um, but what I believe is really important to understand is that uh, uh, we should uh, relinquish uh, the 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 genetic paradigm uh, uh, under which all of evolution is seen at present. Now, th there, there is an important aspect to this because uh, in medicine, in biotechnology, and in all those areas, there is a very direct relationship between certain genetic uh, modifications and, let's say, a disease. You have a, a, a gene that mutates, let's say, for one enzyme, uh, and the enzyme is causing a plethora of symptoms, and you want to find uh, you want to correct that mutation, and so there is a very direct relationship between cause and effect, so to speak. But in evolution, uh, 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 it, it is, it, we should not assume that those, uh, let's say, for example, gene regulatory interactions that we observe in extant organisms are the same ones that are causally responsible for the origination of the traits they are regulating today. So there's a very different kind of problem and, and approach. And I, I would wish that, uh, that people uh, do not jump uh, to very quick conclusions about you know, what the role of genetics is in evolution uh, just because certain things work in biotechnology and we can clone the genes and we can find a personalized uh, treatment or whatever. You know, uh, the evolutionary question is a, a completely different question. Uh, well, uh, what I would like to um, suggest uh, that with all these new developments and uh, you know, we both of, uh, both, both of us have been part of these things, you know. We are sort of architects of these uh, developments with some other people, not too many. Uh, um, so with all these possible component mechanisms that we have been considering, I think it's extremely important also in the future, not also in the past, but also in the future, to what John Maynard has used to call to do the sums. <laughs> now that means to actually have a quantitative uh, estimate of what kind of component process, uh, uh, you know, is, you know, to what extent uh, responsible for a class of phenomena under what circumstances, because this can change. Right? So in a certain situations, just we, let me give you a very uh, blunt example, certain situations, the same epigenetic system could be very important, much more important than the genetics. In another circumstance, you know, it's exactly the other way around. And this has to be quantified, this has to be found out, this, this has to be modeled, right, in order to appreciate, you know, these interlocking dynamics of several things, right? That's, uh, of course, that's difficult, but okay. 
So there are more PhDs, uh, you know, professorships. So there is, in, to that extent, there is hope, conditional on the assumptions that we, we carry on surviving. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. So then uh, it is my duty and task. And at the end, I will give it back to you anyway. So to thank many people. First of all, I would like to thank the audience. You are the greatest participants of this whole series because you were here from the very beginning and you survived 10 <laughs> plus one, 11 lectures, long afternoons, cold rooms, almost cool rooms, and still are here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Then I would like to give an appreciation to those organizations which made this series possible, namely ASTAR and NTU, and the chairman of ASTAR, and the president of MTU, who provided us, Jans Parat Limes, MTU, and the BMRC, with necessary funds to have this series be a success. This series will have a number of major outcomes, apart from the fact that you enjoyed it, I hope. The YouTube lecture series is present on the YouTube. It's on, on the, the Paralimes website. And on the Paralimes website, so it, it's in YouTube format. YouTube chapter, whatever it is called. But also we will have a book. Soon or later, the book will come out with the title CZ's where is it like this? Sorry. 10 on 10. Sydney's 10 on 10, or Sydney's... I don't know. No, no, no. I think that is the... the that is the title. Yeah, John knows better than I do. Yeah, yeah. So there will be a book coming out. Then I would like to express our gratitude together with John to those who helped us organize this series, our colleagues, and uh, primarily Barry Chung, John's PA, and... Uh, event organizer company Tenga, Mary Tang and her associates. So I would say we should give a big hand <laughs> to them as well. Then of course, I would like to express my thanks to the speakers, Gert and Ursch. And last but not least, my very good friend and sparring partner, Jan Fassbinder. Now the word is yours. Okay, thank you all very much, and have a good trip home. We are going to do something interesting in the near future, which is also a 10 in it. We might call it a rev revolution, this R evolution. We're not sure yet, but we're working on it. We'll let you know. You'll be invited because you're on our list. Um, it will be an, 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 actually another interesting exercise, but we're still in the process of seeing whether we can get it funded and can get it organized. Uh, and with that, I would like to close these series. Uh, it's a funny thing to close the series anyway, but the, 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 there's so much going to follow up, as Bala said. Thank you very much, and see you sometimes in the future. Long and cold.